the recording and I'll say, okay, Alicia, tell me what your response to the reading. Okay. Um, I don't do evolutionary theory myself. And I know at one point in time, you know, if you based your stuff on something other than that, it wouldn't be as accepted. Um, because at one point in time, evolution, you know, that was, that was it. And if you weren't on board, you, you know, you didn't know what you were talking about. But I mean, I think we've progressed past that to where that's not the only viable option. Um, How would you describe Laszlo? Let's see. Do you think systems theory is different from what you mean by evolution? I mean, people have very, a lot of different opinions. Some of it's very reductionistic. Well, and his is not reductionistic. No, not at all. He's not reductive at all. And I actually made a note about that. I'll get to in just a second. Um, I like the way he used evolution to show mankind's place in the universe and to explain how, why we do have some unique qualities were not superior to all the other species of animal. It's just that the human animal has the capability for reflective consciousness, which hasn't been found in any other species. Um, I like the fact that he said um, the scientific method led to the fragmented view of the human of humankind because it instead of looking at nature and living in nature as a whole it kind of dissected all of this and pinpointed problems and then specialized work on those focus points and so now nobody has a good knowledge base of the whole unit um we can't be studied without regard for other things. I'm looking for my note on his not being reductive. Yeah, in this class, it's particularly psychology, like, right? It just divides yeah, psychology. Way, he talks about that ability to be reflective that's what he calls self-awareness which i thought was an interesting way Well, let me just start at the beginning and I'll get to it. Okay. Uh, let's see. Okay, so on page 65, he's saying that our consciousness doesn't make us superior because there's that subjective awareness in all species. Um, but then, you know, I asked if there's not a, cre a creator, then why would humankind possess any specific uniqueness, something that other species don't have. And he addresses that. Um, and at the end of it, he says, so is this not a spiritual phenomenon? Yeah. And that's, you know, I haven't gotten much further past that. So, I mean, he says that these things can be manufactured, they can be duplicated, but we weren't, according to evolutionary theory, we weren't manufactured or created. We just happened to become this way and that I don't I can't I don't think we just happened to become this way right you know? I actually I don't think of it as arbitrary either in the sense that I think it was inevitable that it would happen eventually because there would be a mutation because there's constant mutation and the universe is knowable and there's this capacity for self-reflection was always there. So inevitably it would emerge, right? So does that make sense to you? Yeah. I mean, the next person we're going to read says he, he would agree 
He's a quantum physicist, but he says that's why he thinks there is this um, cosmic blueprint, right? There was a mind that set up all the conditions and then let it go. So okay. he just, John Pokinghorn just in, and I have just gotten to the point like a Hindu where some people personify this and some people don't. And it's just the way it is. <laughs> but they will agree on the goal and they will agree on that we need to be sustainable. I mean, you know, who cares as far as I'm concerned, yeah. right? If you really need to think there was that divine mind that set up the conditions, fine. If you really need to think there wasn't, fine. Just do what you're supposed to do, will you? Right. Ah, right. To me, it's a bunch of guys with a bunch of egos. It's, I mean, you know, Gaia is sitting there. Would you please not destroy me? <laughs> right. Right? right? Does that make sense, Alicia? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I found, yeah, that makes sense. And I found what I was talking about, but I wanted to say one more thing on the reflective conscious. Um, you know, that gives people the capacity to order to, or to, to organize our perceptions and our feelings and then act upon it. And that is where I place free will. We right. exert our will upon these things, whereas other animal species do not. Sure, to know that you know. Right. To exactly. also know that you can choose, right. right? Right, right. Because that's how we set up the foundation for our choices. You know, that's how we decide how to interact with the things around us. Sure, I mean, and a, a two-year-old, right, figures out suddenly they're different from their mom, right? Or they're, you know, again, you're so, it's amazing when a kid falls down and looks to you to see if they got hurt, right? Well, then that's what two-year-old is, is that you learn that you have a choice, right? Mm -hmm. Well, as soon as you learn you have a choice, there has to be a reason to choose one way or the other. Right. And that's where ethics comes in, right. right? And then just to have that intuitive awareness that you don't create this universe, it's bigger than you. And it has all these forces that you and humanity did not cre create and do not control. Now, some people can say, well, it's just a self-regulating system that gets more complex. And other people will say that's God consciousness, right? Does that make sense, Alicia? Yeah. Yeah, it does. Um, on page 73, where he's talking about, he has switched from talking about our place in the universe to culture. He said, you know, we became a socio-cultural um, species. And he was making the point, I think, that culture has a presence of its own, just like the beehive that he explained. You know, we aren't reduced just to the individual. You know, we're the individual within the group, and then we're the group within the group. And I just, in that, that's where I saw that he is not a reductionist. He doesn't just boil it back down to the simplest explanation. He sees that's, how complex everything is. Well, that's what sociology, right? Yeah. Studies mm -hmm. human systems, right? Yeah, okay. Um, Ivy, we haven't forgotten you. We're not ignoring <laughs> you. Um, I just, actually, I was thinking if I let Alicia talk, then it might trigger some other ideas. Yeah, you guys are um, basically talking about what I was going to discuss um, from what my takeaway was from the reading. So I'm, I'm glad that you were carrying on with the uh, conversation. Um, but basically what I was just going to say was that I liked how they separated reaction from um, instinct, like how they were talking about with the dog and the bee. And they were talking about how the dog has more of a reaction like they have a choice rather as bees are just working um based off of like what they know are collectively if that makes sense and he was uh, well they were talking about how that is how we build our what is it uh chain if that makes sense like 
animals are below us we all everything has a consciousness they were even talking about how like plants and everything has some sort of consciousness consciousness but it's not like on our level um and so I kind of saw what you know they were coming from but we also don't really we we can't really know for sure we could just guess at it um and then they were also talking about the difference in values and how um there's like I think yeah there's three different types and it was like values that are from the world around us values that are like actual facts and then values that we take in and um I kind of lost what I was trying to say (laughs) sorry actually that there's no facts without values and the, the enlightenment said it's all facts it's no values right but the enlightenment was all about we're going to change things. So we gather facts in a way that enables us to change it, right? So we're not going to see it. So we're always evolving. Values, right? We're not. And so Laszlo saying, wait, everything in nature naturally seeks its good. So mm-hmm. all of those facts are attached to a value, right? Mm-hmm. Which is the good of that creature. But in the enlightenment, you threw away that right that you deliberately threw away the biosphere the ecosphere and you're deliberately looking at nature as silly putty and then you're going to say gee there's no values right (laughs) i mean you set it up for yourself does that make sense Mm -hmm. and uh they're talking about how everything has value right there's because you see the world as uh an ecosystem right in a biosphere Mm -hmm right? It's not superimposed on us. It's natural if we sit back and look at the world and observe it's the way it naturally organizes. Does that make sense? Yes. So we have these naturally organizing systems. Well, in a naturally organizing system, everything is seeking its good. It's trying to survive, right? Mm -hmm. And it's also linear. It gets more and more complex because there's genetic mutation. And then they're tr- it's just testing to see if there's a niche out there. Is there a way for this mutation to actually flourish and reproduce, right? Okay. And that's yeah. why it gets more and more complex. There's a direction to evolution. It's not arbitrary. That's to me when people mean evolution that randomness is a first principle that everything is just random that is not true Mm -hmm. that's why when i asked alicia well what do you mean by evolution right because Mm -hmm. you can have an evolutionary theory where everything has a purpose and a meaning right and then you can have a god that just set it up at the beginning and let it go or you can have a god that sort of like tweaks it (laughs) And then who gets to decide when God is tweaking and when the devil's tweaking? That's That kind of gets to me because as soon as you sort of let that door open, you can make yourself God, right? Does that make sense? Uh, does that make sense to you guys? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Anyway, yeah, that's, that's the kind of evolution I could get behind because we do evolve and grow and change and develop. I just this whole chaos theory, big bang, everything just happened. I can't, I cannot get behind that. But right, um, the part where he said that um, culture was not a goal of evolution. Right. I like that part. So it's the result of it. Right. It's the result of and how consciousness kind of uh, became the director of our evolution that means you might think of a god as the guy who guy okay guy whatever you know that i (laughs) i have trouble with guys in the sky but um so you can think of a deity that started it out but that deity did not intend for christianity to come and control you know right that that setting up of those conditions led to self-conscious awareness but it's free will 
that has led to all this history. Right. Does that make sense? So then you can't start saying, oh, God planned it. We're the city on the hill. Like, <laughs> I don't know. Ivy, are you following this? Yes, sorry. <laughs> okay. I, you know, I'm old and I have these lines of reasoning that you punch the button and it just goes down that way. And I, I lose track <laughs> of whether anybody else can follow me. Um, yeah. So you can accept a lot of things. You can put things together in a lot of different ways than is the standard stuff that's out there in the society. And I would say that the standard stuff out there is maladaptive, like we are self-destructing. So we definitely need some different ideas, right? Because we need different institutions, right? We need we need our A different perspective. Change. Yeah, and I That's and I think anybody who believes in any kind of God would not want us to be going the direction we're going, right? Mm -hmm. Because it was motivated by greed, right? It wasn't mm -hmm. motivated by need, right? Nobody could say that need has driven us to destroy the earth. It's greed. And that goes back to him talking about what nature of culture we will develop. Right. 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 So... You can have a God there that set conditions up to set up self-conscious awareness and a God that rejects a whole lot of what we've done with it, right? Including deciding the sons of Abraham are special. <laughs> I don't, I mean, my idea of God would never put up with that. That just because you were born in this situation, you are morally better than somebody else? Uh, yeah. Well, and, and this is going to get off on a tangent. I'm sorry. But in the New <laughs> Testament, it explains that that is not what he meant. You know, because the Jews were not any better than the Gentiles. Jesus wanted to accept them all to adopt the Jews. I mean, the Gentiles, basically every being in existence, you know, right. outside of the Jews, they were all adopted into this special personhood or whatever. It wasn't just for them. So anyway. And also, I it doesn't make sense to me. And no God would say, but you have to believe. Like, I have to be able to have the power over you to change you. And then I get a little point with God on the judgment day. <laughs> That is not how I think of God. It's like, if somebody went, you know, my idea of the pearly gates, hey, God, I twisted a hundred people's arms and got you. <laughs> and nope. I would say, what the hell are you doing that for? Like, you worry about yourself, buddy. You're, you get, you go in the wrong direction for trying to control other people. <laughs> right. I just have a, such a different view of authority. I actually you know? use an example like that when I'm talking to my kids. You know, if God did not control that decision, then why should we? You know, that's the kind of thing that I've <laughs> told my kids. You know, who am I to I mean, say this is how it's supposed to be? This is how you're supposed to be. Who? Where do I get off telling anybody that? you know well what we do know is we should follow the golden rule right well, yeah we know we have a common humanity right and we know we have self-conscious awareness we know we have choice we know we can make societies that are adaptive or societies that are maladaptive and self-destructive like, how much more do we need to know? <laughs> and also, are you just waiting for some big daddy in the sky to reward you if you're a good <laughs> boy and punish you if you're not? I mean, that goes back to Freud, right? That little daddy in the sky thing. Like, uh, really? Okay. Right. See, and the way you said that just now, 
actually trigger something that, that I've never, because you've mentioned that a lot, the big daddy in the sky. And no, I don't view God that way, but I finally understand what you mean, even though you've been, okay. saying, it, you've been saying it for the last three years. Okay. <laughs> He's not this big vengeful punisher that, you know, I have to live this way or, you know, all hell breaks loose. That's, yeah, no, I don't, I can't perceive of him that way. I, yeah. I mean, Aristotle would say that's a very poorly habituated child. Yeah. Yeah, it takes pleasure in doing what's bad. And then their only hope is to be morally strong, is to be completely internally divided. Right. Never do what they take pleasure in and get rewarded for it. But Aristotle would just say that that's really bad habituation because it pits nature against culture. And of course, and but I mean, Laszlo, here's another thing. I think Laszlo brings in what's good about Aristotle without the racism, the sexism, and all that sort of stuff. So I think we shouldn't even call it Aristotle, right? We should just call it systems thinking or spiritual humanism or something. Because as soon as you say the word Aristotle, he was sexist and racist and like he had all this bad stuff in his application. Of, and he didn't have as much science as we have now. So anyway, um, did you read the whole reading, Ivy? Uh, no, I didn't get all the way to the end. I did That's not. too bad because <laughs> I should probably assign less because the end is where he brings in the Greeks. <laughs> See, I got to that part, but I'm not finished with it. Like I, yeah, said, I, just... I said that whole section apart because I'm going to include it in my paper. <laughs> I mean, it's just really... I'm convinced that Professor Beck bribes all these people and then she then she assigns their books, right? <laughs> oh, I know that you do. No, what? What, I like, what I had gotten out of that so far was that, let's see, okay, how the Western culture didn't start using myth until the beginning of the Hellenistic era. Um. Anyway, he, anyway, he separated philosophy from religion because the one started out with cosmos and the other dealt with faith and let's see, uh, religion, literature, and art. And that was the beginning of the great split that right. led to the um, dual, like the enlightenment type of thinking. Right. Yep, the split was between the philosophers and the poets. Yeah, I was like, oh, this um, is good stuff. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, yeah. If you, my other classes, I say Plato never wanted to split them. That was all ironic. You remember that, Alicia? <laughs> good for you, my star student. <laughs> I remember that. And the example that you used um, in the Demarcus, is that his name? Keep going. The person that we led, we read last week. Demasio. Demasio. Okay. The example of, you know, how Socrates said, you know, virtue was its own reward, but you couldn't live just for that because being virtuous ends up setting you apart as somebody who is not willing to follow the social norms because you see a greater calling you see what's needed so you have to stand up against what's wrong and then it gets turned yeah. against you even yeah. though you are a very virtuous person yeah so, Damasio again is so naive yeah i i mean he says okay you just sort of follow the norms and then you go beyond that and it just he doesn't he doesn't realize that oh, that's problematic and oh gosh, that guy. <laughs> but the thing is, he would have agreed, I think, or if you add Laszlo, okay, you have to anticipate the chapter that I did on Laszlo and Damasio, which is Damasio needed to be supplemented with some of this more holistic thinking in Laszlo, because Damasio doesn't 
go there. He doesn't really have any kind of model. I don't he, think that he really dug deep and did that research. I don't think that he really got himself a good understanding of it. No, he just so, he just went as far as Spinoza yeah. uh, in this book. And he actually read an article. Anyway, somebody sent him something I wrote and he said, well, she hasn't followed what I've said since then. And you know what? I don't want to follow you, Mr. Bozo. I mean, <laughs> you know, I'm not into trying to support you as you correct yourself. You know, mm -hmm. I'm not your little lady to, you know, follow you around. Sure. I, I think he, he should apologize because in 2003, he should have anticipated what was going to happen and he did not So I hold him accountable for that. Um, I, the, the, the reason again that I do is Plato's dialogues are what, about, about what people were doing before Athens lost its democracy. And Plato's trying to teach future readers, don't do this. Um, but Damasio should have known that just passing out opioids, just introducing them into the culture without a whole lot of regulation and stuff is not going to change the human playing field and cure us forever of pain, addiction, violence, and depression. Are you kidding? And so I, I really hold him accountable for what he said at that time. I don't care if you change your mind because by changing his mind, he says, I'm not responsible for that. And I'm saying you are, right? You should mm -hmm. never have said what you said. Does that make Yeah, sense? he put his thoughts out there into the world and that he might not have meant for it to like make, you know, some kind of impact, but it's stuck with someone. Thanks. Right. No, he's a classic <coughs> Apollo. He's Apollo, you know, thinks he's going to save the world with reason. Um, but he, sh he really is responsible for how stupid that is. Mm -hmm. Did that make sense to you, Ivy? Yeah. I mean, for him to say nature is evil because we die. And I mean, think of how many billions and billions and billions of bucks we're spending because people are afraid of death and they refuse mm -hmm. to die. And you think of all the children who do not get education or even healthcare because all this stupid money is going to these stupid old people that won't die. Does that make sense? Yeah, I um, saw a post uh, earlier that was saying that if you have like a donor's heart on your card to like take that off because they uh, typically don't care about you at the hospital. If you're like in critical condition, they're like quick to kill you off and harvest your organs to give it to someone that's, you know, richer, if that makes sense. Um, so I feel like I, I see where he's get where they're going with that. that <laughs> Actually, I, I wouldn't mind if it went to a younger person. I don't know. Oh, I'm saying uh, not necessarily younger, but someone more wealthy, you know, just trying to there's that. keep on with life a little bit longer. Well, that's that where sense? when somebody tried to have panels where you would make decisions about who would get that heart, mm -hmm. if it had to be the 90-year-old rich person or the 20-year-old poor person, they would give it to the younger one. And then the Republicans called it death panels, just yeah. to get votes. Those are death panels. You know, you're, you know, you're willing, signing the death certificate. It was Ivy, no context at all. What but idea was Ivy tying that back to? She was tying it back to the fear of death. And, and for me, well, I'm gonna get cremated. Actually, the way they work it, where I mean they work it in every state you can have your body given to the University of Minnesota med school and they will use everything for your cadaver for all this stuff whatever they need it for and then they will cremate it and then every year they have a big memorial service for everybody so that's what my parents did and you can do that in Arkansas too if you like my father did that um we were living in Oklahoma at the time um, but he, he donated his body to science 
and then after they were done, they sent us his remains in a biodegradable heart-shaped thing that you can plant, oh. and it has seeds in the top of it, and it grows flowers. So, oh, well, that's nice. That's yeah. nice. I have a, a great story about my father's ashes, but I don't want to talk about it now. Um, okay, it's the funniest story, and if you ever want to do that later on, you'll get a you'll get a laugh. Anyway, so we're talking about Lazlo, and all I'm saying with Damasio is that he his conclusion about the flourishing life was that. You could have Spinoza's view with the intellectual route to God, which is contemplating science and listening to music and um, what? Thinking, um, ordering your emotions so that they follow the truth. But he's just a privileged white guy sitting in his office, listening to music and thinking how great science is because he's saving the world. and. Um, you know, trying to eat right, right? <laughs> but that's nothing to do with life. And then he, you know, he's saying, well, institutionalized religion actually has a function because it helps people with homeostasis, right? So his particular homeostasis is by doing that, living a very contemplative, separated life, but also believing that his opioid research, say, you know, is saving the world. And in 20 years, which is actually due to be next year, we will no longer have pain, addiction, depression, or violence. Aren't you looking forward to that, girls? I am. One more year. We are so <laughs> far away from that. I'm how on many the list? Yeah. Yeah. How many tens of thousands of people are you know die of opioid? Oh. And it's funny. I saw. It. Well, it's not funny, but. There has been again a influx in the media where they I saw a lot of people posting about how more people are doing meth and then I saw a ad for like a um what is what is it called? Um those tests that they do, uh collective survey, I guess. And they had a um ad for like meth users and I'm like, why is this why is drugs just being so everywhere? You know, like, can we focus on something else? But if it's not drugs, it's like violence and all the things that we've been talking about drives humanity. Well, I've, I'm just starting to think about as a teacher, right? Mm -hmm. I do think you need to know when you went to college, what you were stepping into in terms of mm -hmm. the flow of history, right? Nobody really gave me that perspective. I was, I went to college in the middle of the 60s and it would have been nice if a teacher had just said, okay, Martha, you need to get some sense of the historical moment here, right? Just mm -hmm. because when my kids went to, to college, it was, it was so different. I mean, when I was in high school, I was a straight A student and my teachers didn't like me because I was the local communist daughter and I hated school. And it was just someone needed to tell me this is not normal, but it was all I knew. And I think that older people forget that smart high school kids can really not know anything in terms mm -hmm. of history. And so I want to tell you, right, that I think according to somebody like Laszlo, that you're stepping in at a moment. That's why if you just read a little further down, if you before, please try to read the reading because um, mm -hmm. it says, if, first of all, it does say religions would not have to sacrifice or even compromise their cherished tenets to make a unique contribution to this shift in consciousness towards systems thinking. Um, there's obviously, he says, a significant humanistic and ecumenical component in every great religion. Judaism sees humans as God's partners in the ongoing work of creation. Um, at the heart of the Christian teaching is love for a universal God and loving your fellows. Islam has a universal and ecumenical aspect. 
the ta ta tahi, there's no God but Allah, is an affirmation of unity, right? Not division. Hinduism perceives the essential oneness. Buddhism, interrelation of all things. The Chinese, the harmony, Taoism. So I think you can understand this, right? This is, you can see where that's going, is that if it's a holistic kind of thinking, it's not going to split religion off, right? There's a humanistic branch of each religion. That's page 89, I think, Alicia. Um, and then the other thing that I do think you really need to know um, that, okay, religious renewal, this is from page 90 to 91. So we're right toward the end here. Religious renewal always came in the wake of civilizational crisis. It was in the disastrous moments of the history of Israel that the prophets of Judea made their appearance. Christianity established itself in the chaos left by moral weakening of the citizens of a declining Roman empire. The Buddha appeared in a period of spiritual and social confusion. Uh, Muhammad proclaimed his mission in an epic of disorder in Arabia and the Baha'i leader of the Baha'i wrote in a confinement, he was in prison, imposed by a moribund Ottoman Empire. So we live in a moment definitely of decline, right? And, but what I want, what I really need to teach my students is that I think that the courses I teach are trying to give students a tool to cope with what's coming but not just to cope with it, but to be leaders. Like somebody has to lead, right? Mm -hmm. Somebody has to step out of what's happening. And um, because, you know, not be fatalistic and not be afraid and not be naive and not try to escape. Like somebody has to lead. And I hope my students would take that on. I definitely think the mission statement of liberal arts colleges is exactly the kind of person that we need more and more. And the more discouraging it gets, the more important it is for you to lead, right? So you have to take every discouraging moment and make it into, well, that's why I need to do this. And especially you too, right, Ivy <laughs> and Alicia? because you've been through so much um, that you can lead, right? Because you've learned to get over obstacles um, and you've learned actually how to con eventually, I'm not sure at some point to confront your trauma and heal your trauma. Like you're not denying it and you're not looking at people and say, put up and shut up. You're just saying somebody has to lead. And the fact it's even more compelling if it's somebody who's been through some stuff, right? Um, but anyway, that's that would be the punchline is that you can have a view of science. You can have a view like Laszlo, the way he thinks of evolution, it's not anti-meaning, it's not anti-religion. And it's also in the moment that we really need to move towards sustainable. And right now we really are moving. We're just ignoring, you know, running away. We've got a huge percentage of our people are not coping with it, right? QAnon, liberals are a bunch of pedophiles. Like that's gonna solve our problems. It's really scary, but again, you can have a unified worldview you can have a worldview that's going to inspire you, right? Um, and so, and then next time we have Mr. Davies, the quantum physicist, who actually agrees with a lot of Laszlo. He just brings in this um, cosmic blueprint that there was a mind behind it, but that mind doesn't favor. That mind behind it could say, this whole patriarchy thing was one big mistake and it was going to lead to the destruction um, unless it was constantly tempered and it wasn't constantly tempered. And so, you know, 
that's not God's will for this to happen. That was just self-conscious awareness, deliberately denying our place in the universe, exploiting nature and without in, enough limits. The people who originally started it, the Enlightenment thinkers, a lot of them knew we'd, we'd come to a point where we'd have to control the population. We'd have to, you know, we'd have to worry about sustainability. They knew that 250 years ago, but they thought that everybody would love science by them because science obviously made things better and obviously work. So they would listen to the scientists. That's what they thought. <laughs> Is that happening? But again, they're just like Damasio. They're just like, do you understand that? That, ah, Apollo is going to do all these things for us. But oh. we're also going to totally, you know, self-correct. When it just like Mr. Damasio, ah, opioids are going to do all these things, but we will totally self-correct. None of that's going to be a problem. <laughs> does, does that, can you see the analogy there? Mm -hmm. We're going to redesign societies. We're going to have these wonderful middle classes. John Stuart Mill, right? And so can you see the analogy to, between Damasio and John Stuart Mill? He just thinks, you know, we'll just re-social engineer things and that'll be great. And Damasio is just, and he even knows that that happened in the past. He says, you know, there have been social engineering projects in the past that didn't work, but it's different this time because this time we really know how the brain works. And the truth is this time it's even worse <laughs> because those opioids are incredibly addictive because you guys really know how the brain works. <laughs> You're just getting better at this, but it's getting to be a more and more uh, powerful tool for good or evil. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the way the stuff comes together, I think is pretty amazing. But he does say, you know, in the Greeks, that was when things got split. And when I teach the Greeks, I just gave a lecture on this on Saturday at a conference, that the Oracle of Delphi, where it has the, the site that where it used to be the goddess was worshipped, and then Apollo came and killed the python, was a snake. So the snake represents the cycles of nature. It sheds its skin, grows a new skin. So Apollo, the god of reason, came to that site, and he killed the python, and he ruled there. So symbolically, from now on, Apollo is going to protect Gaia. And we're going to have these cultures that are going to be driven by Apollonian reasoning, science, math. And so every generation is going to get more and more complex because of that, right? We're gonna make the transition from primarily a cyclical culture to primarily a linear uh, human history because of Apollo. But the whole site is about Apollo, you've got to stay in your place. Apollo, you have to listen to Athena. I mean, they're really aware that this could go bad. Um, and so that's what Laszlo is saying, that things got split during the Greeks. And my view is that there were a lot of wise people that were trying to prevent that. Um, it didn't happen, right? The split keeps going. And um, so we keep having these blindnesses, right? Mr. Damasio is so blind. And like, it's been that way forever. There are myths about Apollo giving humanity these wonderful gifts. <laughs> God, it looks great. And then it, you know, goes bad. So, um, so that's, all right. So how do we fit all this in? We have Damasio, um, realizing he's rejecting the psychology of the enlightenment, the dualism and the reductionism. He's making, saying it's all holistic and it's based on ideas. Like we can change our neural mapping and we should. Ideas cause ideas. We need to think globally. 
We need to think in terms of international. Mr. Laszlo would agree with that, right? We need to think holistically. Yes. It's just that Damasio then heads south, <laughs> right? And so Laszlo picks up. They both agree that all you don't have to reject religion. Um, it's just that Damasio says you don't have to reject institutional religion because people come to churches to get homeostasis, to feel comfortable. And I'm saying, wait a second. <laughs> a lot of the reason they feel comfortable where well, when they do, they start creating uh, an enemy. And that's why it's so easy to weaponize institutionalized religion. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And he never talks about that. He just doesn't get it that that can go south pretty easily. Um, so Mr. Laszlo picks up and um, he, now his big thing is that he really rejects, again, the enlightenment, the mechanistic view. We need a holistic view. We can take what's good from Aristotle, and now we don't have to call it Aristotle. We can call it systems thinking. Uh, we can adapt it to our time, and we don't have to reject religion, but you're very specific about what it is in the religion. And if some institutionalized version uh, doesn't stick to that humanistic universal basis, you got to, it's maladaptive. You have to reject it. Does that make sense to you guys? Does that make sense to you, Ivy? Yes. Uh, basically, it goes back to how everything you were saying is um, <coughs> are you okay? male orientated. Sorry, my dog's like, Hoffing up Olivia over here, um, if that makes sense. Actually, you... actually, I was thinking as another way to kind of, I don't know about you, but in my mind, I have to make associations, right? I have to, mm -hmm. I'm creating neural network, right? I'm doing that. I've been doing that all the time in my life. And I've done it sort of a little bit more recently, but okay. So you have your um, uh, dog, right? And I read about your dog. Okay, so now you can think of him on this continuum of Laszlo, right? This continuum of consciousness. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so he has sensation and he imitates you, right? And he, I'm sure that he... he has a personality. Right. And I'm sure you have a, a emotional bond with him too. Like mm -hmm. he, if something happened to you, I'm sure you'd be very unhappy, right? Mm -hmm. Um. But there's something you have that he doesn't have, right? You have this, he doesn't know that he knows, right? Yes, and I'm aware that I know. Yes, and that's why animals didn't develop language, right? Because language becomes a whole symbol system where it's, mm -hmm. you can, human beings, you know, are motivated often by things that aren't in front of their face at all, right? A dog isn't going to say, well, I'm not going to bite Ivy because I might go to hell, you know, <laughs> right? I mean, <laughs> yeah, so they're just basically running on what they feel, not morals. Yeah, and habits, they have compassion, yeah. you know, they have all sorts of emotions that are very gentle and whatever. Um, and you can reduce people, you know, if somebody hurts you, your dog might bite them or something, right? You can mm -hmm. say, that's just like a mother. All right, we have instinctual drives, but we have a lot more than that. I mean, you can have mothers that don't attach to their babies. Like, what the hell? But that's because, you know, we have choice and we can really become perverted. So I think the reason people hesitate to say that human beings are more complex and sophisticated is that that advantage has been used to justify why we can abuse animals, why we can treat them just like tools, mm -hmm. why we can put them in these factory farms because we're superior and we're special. It's, that's not it, Ivy. Like, no, that's not, that's right. inhumane, even though they're not, you know, humans, we're, we're all still animals. 
yeah if that makes sense where it's just one is more evolved than the other right i think that's kind of what you guys were trying to that's what what laszlo is saying so when you're with your dog you can just think about well yeah i'm uh, higher in this continuum but i depend on that and i have some of those same emotions it's just that i can also like i can suddenly kill my dog just because i feel like it you know mm-hmm. and I, your dog isn't going to just suddenly bite you because he feels like it right mm-hmm. it's a reaction because you know something probably traumatic right. or whatever yeah. right so your dog responds to outside stimuli and because you've been with him long enough he has a memory right mm-hmm. and so he can sort of predict what you're going to do and all that right mm-hmm but that's based on memory. It's not, he's not consciously aware that he's predicting something. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's kind of like how a fly, you think that uh, when you're squatting at a fly, it's like dodging your hand, but really they, um, they actually move at like random, like really randomly. So they're just dodging you on pure luck. Right. So actually the fly, but your, your dog has a higher level of consciousness than that. Right. So he Uh has a memory. I don't know, our family dog, when my brother came home from football practice and he emptied out the water dish and went up to the sink and started opening the can, the dog knew what's coming, right? (laughs) It's supper time, right? Because he has a memory. And so your dog has a memory and your dog can sort of anticipate stuff based, but it's all based on stimulation from before uh-huh. in in a pattern right and your dog will be more stable if you send consistent signals right yes yeah and if you start acting unpredictably probably your dog would would not be happy yes, yeah but you know and little bit kids are like that too you need a lot of uh, order in their lives it's just that human beings can go way beyond that both for good or evil, right? Yes. So it's, it's, anyway, that's something you could think about. You could think about Laszlo, right? And you can think about, well, that's why you have responsibility to sort of think about the direction our culture should take and being part of the solution rather than part of the problem. And you can put it all together. And your old, your dog isn't going to be able to do that, but your dog's happiness will depend on that, because everybody's happiness depends upon whether we figure out how to create an adaptive, sustainable society, right? Uh-huh. I remember most of what I did was always or do, so that my kids and grandkids have some hope for a livable world, because it, it's an issue. Um, but what I want to get to people is it's shouldn't, you've got to find a way not to be depressed about it or anxious about it. And the way is to say that every time you read something where people are going the wrong way, you say, well, somebody has to lead and it's going to be me. Right. Does that make sense? Ivy? Uh And does that make sense to you, Alicia? And really, it's what you've always thought, Alicia, right? I just keep kind of reminding you, or I keep giving you more readings and stuff. Um, All right, so next time we have, um, next time, come having finished reading, Laszlo, and, you know, confirm or whatever, and then we'll do um, Davies, and he's a quantum physicist, and he's he's written books god and the new physics and he talks about the soul and he too talks about ideas cause ideas he just uses computers and artificial intelligence which i think is really interesting um and i think everything kind of converges but you will definitely get people who disagree in every one of these issues well that's why life is meaningless blah 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 (sighs) but they will. It's not just evolution. It's everything. Somebody presupposes that and and they're as dogmatic 
as any fundamentalist in the universe, as far as I'm concerned. They just do not want anything to have meaning. And it seems obvious to me that meaning is built into everything. Everything has meaning and purpose because everything can lead to flourishing or lead away from flourishing. How much more meaning do you need? Right? The daddy in the sky. <laughs> All right, Ivy, we'll let you go. I have another class with Alicia now, unless you want to talk about goddesses. Oh, okay, <laughs> have fun. Bye-bye. Well, what did you think of um, Sophia conversing I, with those goddesses? I really, really, uh, okay. I like Sophia. And I think maybe this is where it's so much more fun to teach older women this stuff, right? Because they've had, if they haven't had all those conversations in their head, they've had enough of them to get it, right? I don't know. I think I have a lot of Sophia in me. I would say I may resonate with her as much as or if more than with Hestia, if you take like the dialogue that she's having between like, okay, so her ultimate goal is the harmony between nature and culture. But if you, the way that I read her is to step back from that you know, the search for harmony within the individual. And I really see that. But what my ultimate desire is, is to be able to help other people figure out how to live in harmony with culture and themselves, you know, and that's what her ultimate goal is. Um, how to take what it is that they desire and pursue them with prudence, you know, know when to do what. And mm -hmm. I don't know, I really, at first I felt like I was being too full of myself by saying, oh, you know, I identify with wisdom, but I do. And because of, you know, what I've been through and it's because of what I've been through that people can recognize right. the experience and the wisdom. Right. You know? The same so, which is, Ivy. Yeah. I mean, you could see if Ivy can just have enough resilience to keep going mm -hmm. by the time she's your age, right? She'll have a lot to offer. Mm -hmm. And especially to African-American women, right? Because she's, you know, she understands that in a way that you don't, right? And yeah, it's just, I just, I hope, right, that she can, she's just got a lot of obstacles, but so do you. Um, actually, I wrote this one afternoon, right? And I actually wrote it when I was in the middle of all this stuff, too. That's why I could write it one afternoon. Um, the thing that amazes me is that I don't have all those voices yelling at me since I moved back to Minnesota. Um, yeah, I had them and it's hard. But the other thing I was gonna ask you, do men have voices like this in their heads? I think they do, but not as much. I think that they're able or more willing to tune it out and just you know make a decision and be okay with it without worrying about whether or not this is you know what what's going to happen because of this or what if I should have done this other thing you know it's but then again I don't know if that's a specific you know difference between the genders or just difference between people or the culture. Right, right. 
because it's not that I'm necessarily a worry ward. It's just that I know there's so many different outcomes to one decision because the effects, they grow, you know, it's exponential. I, and I can only see a certain number of steps away from me. I can't see all the ripples. So, well, there's also, I, I, I think actually Melinda Gates said that research shows that men who actually are the primary caregivers and are really engaged in the activity, their body chemistry changes. And that's amazing because I know that women, oxytocin just when they get pregnant and they nurse and everything. But, and so I just thought that's a difference, but that's interesting though. I mean, I know some house husbands, but they weren't as engaged, right? Every, the house husband that I knew, every time I saw him when the kids were little and he was in charge, he was always talking about that he was working on his dissertation. You know, I mean, I didn't well, think he was bonded to them the way that I was bonded to my kids. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, when Matt became the house mom, you know, the whole plan was for him to stay at home with the kids so that I could put what I needed to into the store that I was taking over and not have to be torn between here and there so that I could know that the home front was taken care of and the kids were being seen to and loved.